All right, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Yes, very good. All right, so we need to clear that out of there. Okay, so a little bit of kind of class business here before we um, get underway. Um, if you haven't checked it out already, uh, we've got I've got an announcement just kind of explaining um, how we're going to proceed for the rest of the semester since the district has declared that we will be on remote instruction all the way through the end. Um, so um, at least for the time being, still plan on streaming on Twitch, although I've been dealing with some interesting aspects of Internet culture that I might end up switching us um, over on to confer Zoom uh, through our Canvas shell. Uh, but we'll see how things go. Um, um, <clears throat> continue to um, access all of the online laboratory materials. Um, I was actually able to find an entire website that had all of those Shape of Life videos for you guys to use as supplemental information as you learn about the different animal groups. Uh, so there's a, a page um, on Canvas to provide you with the appropriate link for that. Um, as far as turning in laboratory notebooks, it's going to be a little cumbersome for you guys but really the best strategy, I think, is to continue to um, continue to um, write in your laboratory notebooks and then photograph and then convert um, using some kind of a document app, convert your um, images into um, PDF files or something else that can be uploaded into Canvas. I've also changed some of the deadlines uh, for that so that you won't turn in your notebook until the Tuesday after spring break. Uh, so it gives you a little more time to get things together and organized and do some of that extra work. Um, the other thing is going to be the exams. Um, as I uh, put into the announcement, exams are going to be um, pretty much like what we used to call take-home exams, which were entire like short answer essay type exams. So there won't be any multiple choice, true, false. It's all just going to be uh, selected um, questions out of the study guide. And so really your best strategy is to really, if you haven't been doing it already, really go into those study guides, really work out your answers ahead of time. The exam will get posted and I've also moved the date for that exam to April the 9th. That'll be the Thursday after we get back from break. Um, it will be made available for an 18-hour window starting 6 a.m. and have to be completed by midnight. And then once you access it, though, you only have four hours to submit answers to it. So if you're going to try to do it all in one session and write everything out as you go along, um, you can and you get basically the same amount of time uh, that you would have had for the other exams. Um, you're just going to have more questions. I think I've worked out the math and I'm going to end up putting like 14 total questions on there, 13 regular credit and then one extra credit question. Um, and so it's just a matter of <sighs> nice gaming chair. Yes, it's not actually mine. I'm borrowing my wife's office and she's the one who has the comfy chair. Anyways, um, so back to the exam. That's kind of the plan on that one. Um, so certainly I anticipate that this is an open book test. So you might think, oh, great, I can look up all the answers. Yes, but that also means that, you know, I'm really going to be able to grade very harshly on your accuracy because I know you have all of the correct answers available to you. You just have to put it together. Okay, here's my wife a gamer. Yes, she is. And um, <clears throat> she does a lot of work for a charity organization called Extra Life. If you're more interested in that, uh, send me a message um, or an email or something and I can let you more about how to actually turn gaming into a way to raise money to help children's hospitals, which is what she does. So, um, okay, so with that, um, I think that's all of the basic business. Um, if you have any other questions, again, throw them into the chat and we'll try to address them or again, send me a message through Canvas or email and we'll just get used to the new normal here. Okay, so where did we leave off? We left off, we were starting to talk about how the cardiac cycle in a mammalian heart actually kind of works and what keeps it running on that rhythmic basis. And so these are some of the 
points that we made last time that really the um, the way that a heart is told to contract is first through the spread of a muscle action potential throughout the organ. So again, it's just like a nerve action potential, the way the nervous system operates. It just it spreads from muscle cell to muscle cell. Okay. We'll get back. Okay, question just came up. Okay, so for the labs, are you allowed to use the unlabeled photos? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, find the unlabeled photos in Canvas and then go ahead and add your own labels to them. Show me that you can still go through and identify them. Of course, most of those photos do have a labeled version as well, so you're kind of just kind of copying over, but that physical act, I think, will just reinforce your ability to identify the anatomy. And then again, you'll have that um, available to you on the lab quizzes. Okay, uh, so back, again, back to um, cardiac cycle. So again, we're using an electrical signal that spreads through the muscle tissue of the heart, and it is through that electrical signal that the tissue, the muscle itself, begins to respond. All right. The important thing on maintaining the cycle is that there has to be the appropriate direction. In other words, the, the signal must spread in the right direction as well as be timed in the right way so that all the different parts of the heart can contract in the appropriate manner to maintain the flow of blood through the heart. <clears throat> and so in order to kind of keep this stuff all coordinated, there's a special collection of cardiac muscle cells that are organized into something we call the conduction system of the heart. And so the first one is something referred to as the sinoatrial node or the pacemaker of the heart. Then there's an atrioventricular node. And by the way, both of those terms sort of indicate roughly where they are in the heart. The sinoatrial node is located near a, a feature of the heart, a vessel um, that opens into the right atrium of the heart known as um, uh, the cardiac sinus. I'm sorry, the coronary sinus, um, which goes into the right atrium of the heart. Um, and then, of course, the atrium itself. Atrioventricular means right between the atria and the ventricles, that sort of thing. And then these other structures are within the walls of the ventricles themselves. There is the bundle of Hiss, and, which then splits into left and right bundle branches. Those run through the interventricular septum, the thick wall between right and left ventricles. And then there are these uh, final structures called Purkinje fibers. These spread up through the outer walls of both the right and the left ventricle. So those are kind of the locations of those structures. But now we want to take a look at how these things work. All right. And so it all starts at the sinoatrial node. All right. And so how does that work? Well, the sinoatrial node is very interesting because unlike a lot of other cells that can produce action potentials, most other cells only produce an action potential when they're stimulated by an outside source, either a chemical stimulus or a physical stimulus of some type that causes the membrane potential to change. What's interesting about the SA node is that these cells can actually create their own action potentials. They self-generate. All right, so I want to take a little bit of time here to talk about how and why that works and kind of work you guys, explain it through this graph that you can see on top here. All right. So the way that the action potential that starts spreading through the heart begins is because the cells of the SA node um, never maintain a true resting membrane potential, that the membrane voltage is constantly cycling between um, a low point of around negative 60 millivolts, and then it kind of gradually increases due to um, the leakage of sodium ions until it hits a threshold. All right. So these special channels are referred to as funny channels. All right, and that wasn't just kind of a, a, a facetious name. When uh, scientists studying cardiac muscle membranes really started to look at these proteins, what they found is that they did behave in a way that was really kind of odd or funny because they didn't just open when they hit a certain voltage or they weren't just opened as a result of um, 
<clears throat> some kind of a chemical signal. Instead, they were always a little bit leaky. And then as more and more sodium flows through them and the membrane potential becomes um, a little more negative, then that just allows even more sodium to flow in, which then reverses that negativity. And we go from our low point of negative 60 and it slowly and it gradually rises on a very steady pace. So this is the, um, this is again referred to as the pacemaker potential is this yellow section in the graph, this slow rise, until we got to a threshold period of negative 40 millivolts. All right. Once that happens, again, this is where cardiac muscle cells are a little bit different. Rather than using more sodium, although there is some sodium channels in here, but then a new set of calcium ion channels that are voltage gated, those open up, and as a result of it, so there, there it is. Once they hit threshold, those voltage gated calcium channels open up, allowing a massive depolarization, reading, getting us to the peak point. And then at that point, the potassium channels are able to open up and lead to a repolarization. Right. So we got the rising phase is due to an influx of calcium channels here in the heart. Again, that makes that different from the way it was in nervous system cells and even in skeletal muscle cells. It's this calcium influx. All right. And yes, again, there you see yet another example of why calcium is such an important substance for physiological processes. It makes your heart work. All right. And then we get to our potassium, and that causes repolarization. And then we bottom out at negative 60, and now the funny channels can begin to reopen, and we start another um, pacemaker potential, bringing us up to threshold again. All right. So this just continuously cycles, and so there is a natural rate and a rhythm because every time one of these action potentials is generated, now that signal can be spread through the rest of the heart and result in a contraction. Now what's interesting is that the rate at which pacemaker potentials are generated and then the full-on action potential is generated is actually slightly faster than the normal resting heart rate, like for a human, which is around 70 beats per minute. That would indicate 70 action potentials per minute. Turns out that the natural um, cycling of the pacemaker is a little bit higher than that, between 75 and 80 times a minute. Okay, so the reason why our resting heart rate is actually lower than the natural beating of the pacemaker is because there is still um, an overriding factor coming from our autonomic nervous system that can help to cause kind of a slight inhibition of the natural uh, rate set by the heart. But what this means though is that without that regulation, the heart will still beat all by itself. You know, and this is something that I read about and that they actually did way back in the day is they would take laboratory specimens, live laboratory specimens, and they would harvest the sinoatrial node cells, the pacemaker cells off of laboratory animal hearts. And they could keep them alive in like a Petri dish, just making sure that they had all of the oxygen and nutrients and all of that. And they could actually observe these cardiac muscle cells twitching under the microscope creating their own contractions, completely separated from the rest of the heart. Yeah. And then they would do a little experiments, like they would take individual cells and they would all twitch kind of at their own rate, but then as soon as they got them to touch one another and contact the membranes from, to each other, then all of the individual cells would twitch simultaneously. So it's really kind of cool. All right, well, let's move on here. And let's talk about kind of the rest of the spread of this signal. All right, so from the SA node, there actually are specific um, networks of cardiac muscle cells that we kind of still call fibers. And those allow the action potential first to be spread very rapidly across to both the right and the left atrium so that this electrical signal, which spreads, again, very, very rapidly, is able to wash over both atria and result in contraction. Now, even though it's very, very rapid, kind of follow my cursor up here. So it starts in the SA node here. 
under number one, and then it spreads. And of course, the first cells that get depolarized then immediately start contracting, while cells that are a little bit further away, it, you know, it's still going to be, you know, a few fractions of a millisecond before they get the signal begin to contract. And so contraction of the atria starts right here at the base of the heart which I know looks weird because I'm pointing to the top, but we call that the base because it's the wider portion of the heart compared to the apex of the heart, which is the narrow, the kind of the, the, the pointed part. So even though the heart is kind of looks in these pictures a little bit upside down, up here is the base, down here is the apex. And so we contract from the base towards the apex, and that's what squeezes here at two, and it squeezes the atria so that the last little bits of blood can be forced down into the ventricles. All right. But now we have an interesting problem, which is if the action potential simply spreads from the base of the atria towards the side where the valves are, and then continued straight down, that would still stimulate the upper portions of the heart to begin to contract, but they would start contracting before the atria had a chance to finish squeezing blood down. And so we can't have the ventricles contracting because as soon as they contract, all right, as soon as they contract, they start forcing blood back up and the contraction pulls on the bicuspid and the tricuspid valves, and that would prevent the ejection of blood from the atria down into the ventricles. So we need to the heart needs to give the atria time to finish the physical squeezing, that physical contraction. And so that's where the signal gets to this second part, the AV node. All right. When it gets to the AV node, the cells of the AV node, they are stimulated, but these on the other hand, don't respond as quickly in, in continuing the action potential. They delay it just a little bit. They delay it, at least in humans, about a tenth of a second, which is allowing atrial systole to complete. And so it's just kind of like putting a pause on the spread of the electrical impulse. And so it's delayed here at the AV node. And then from there, the ventricles can now contract. But there here comes another problem, and it has to do with the structure of the heart itself. So if you've studied the heart, you remember that down here, the ventricles and the apex of the heart, that's closed off. Right? The exits to the ventricles are located up and closer to the base. Remember, the aorta and the pulmonary trunk both exit in the direction towards the base of the heart, in that cranial direction or superior direction. Right? So if the heart were to contract if you kind of follow my cursor, if we were to contract here around where the valves are first, that would narrow the upper part of the heart and start squeezing blood down to the blind end, where it can't go anywhere. So it's really important that the ventricles contract from the apex back up again. So you need to contract from the apex and then squeeze the blood from the bottom towards the top. You know, it's like, you know, squeezing a tube of toothpaste. You know, if you squeeze from near the neck of the thing, you might get a little bit of toothpaste out the top, but you're going to squeeze most of the stuff down towards the bottom. But if you squeeze from the bottom of the tube, you know you're going to force everything up out the opening. And so it's the same problem here. So that's why you have the rest of the conduction system right here. Okay, the AV node has to transmit the impulse down to the apex. And so that is what happens first through the bundle of Hiss, which is this immediate little narrow section past the AV node, and then that immediately splits into left and right bundle branches, and that's what sends the signal first down to the apex. And then once it gets to the apex, side branches, and particularly the side branches around the outer walls of the heart, those are going to go up and allow the action potential to spread to the cells, the regular cardiac muscle cells at the apex, starting contraction at the apex and working its way back upwards towards the exits to the heart. And again, so the whole point to all of this is to make sure 
that we have this directionality of contraction and it makes the flow of blood through the heart much more efficient. Okay. So that's the conduction system of the heart. All right. Now, a couple of other things though is that we've learned to kind of take advantage of the fact that this conduction system is in fact an electrical event. Okay. And we can measure this electrical activity. And we put that to really, really good use to be able to measure the health of the heart and how well it's functioning. All right. Because the, again, these are action potentials. These are changes in voltage across cellular membranes. But as you change the voltage, all right, you cause electrical current to flow throughout the organism's body. Because as a few ions shift, okay, that does create a charge imbalance. And whenever you have a difference between positive and negative areas, electric electricity can flow because all of the bod bodily fluids, what we call the extracellular fluids, are also known as interstitial fluids, those are filled with charged particles, what we call electrolytes, but those would be all of the ions that are in solution, sodium and potassium and chlorine ions. All of those charged particles respond to the flow of current, and as they move around, we can put electrical sensors on a subject's skin and depending on the placement of those sensors, measure the direction and the flow of electricity. And this is what produces what is now known as an electrocardiogram, the ECG, although it was originally developed um, by a doctor in uh, Germany, a guy by the name of Eindhoven. And of course, um, the original spelling, and if you look at older medical shows like on TV and all that, they talked about what is the EKG. So you might, be, you might have heard of EKGs before. And the reason it was EKG is that in German, you spell the word cardio with a K and not with a C. All right. Why? Well, because they're Germans and that's how they roll. Um, but then I guess something was starting to happen in America and English, other English speaking countries And um, the problem is um, maybe just one of spelling, and people were misspelling in English cardio with a K, and so they switched over and started calling it an ECG rather than an EKG. All right. So what is the ECG exactly? Well, it kind of shows you how the heart is functioning in terms of um, generating the, the electrical impulse and which kind of areas of the heart um, are experiencing um, depolarization and repolarization. So if you kind of look in the, the graph right here, the ECG part down at the bottom, you'll see that there is this kind of initial depolarization that happens at the, um, when the pacemaker cells generate the action potential. And then as it spreads through the rest of the atria, you get this kind of up and down sweep on the graph. This is indicating that <clears throat> the atria are being depolarized. And since they're being depolarized, that's, that's our, we know that if we can measure the electricity, then we know that the muscle tissue itself is going to now be responding, say, over the next one-tenth of a second. All right. So that just kind of lets us know we have good atrial depolarization. Now the next part again is a little confusing because there's kind of a dip in the signal, a big peak, and then another dip. All right, so these little peaks right here are referred to as the QRS complex. All right, I don't know why Dr. Eindhoven first labeled the, the first wave, the first portion of this um, graph as a P wave. I'm sure he had his reasons, but for whatever reasons, everything else is kind of going in alphabetical order beyond that. So after P comes Q and then R and then S. And so that refers to the actual points down here. So Q is this first little dip. The big peak is the R. And then this final little dip is the S right here. They always happen in the same way, though. So we refer to this as a QRS complex. All right. What is happening here? Well, it's indicating that the ventricle tissue is now being depolarized. And as a result of it, 
the muscle tissue begins to relax. Now you'll notice that the magnitude of the wave is much greater. Well, that's because the ventricles are so much smarter, or so much, um, so much greater. There's so much more massive tissue there, I should say. All right, so we get this QRS complex as the ventricles and all that contract. All right, and then there's this final part that they didn't color down here. Um, again, if you follow the cursor, you can see that there's this little dome right here. It's a little bit bigger than the P wave. This one is called the T wave. And the T wave is simply indicating that the ventricles are now repolarizing. And it's just showing the flow of ions now as we're going back from a depolarized to a repolarized state. And again, what's interesting, though, is that this, depending on where you place your electrode sensors um, around the heart, and you can put them in different places because every set of electrode sensors kind of has a positive pole, a negative pole, and then usually you have a ground wire somewhere. And depending on where you position the positive and negatives relative to the heart, you can measure the flow of electricity around the heart in different directions. Um, and as a result of it, with the correct training, you can then interpret how these um, ECG lines get produced and determine whether or not the heart is healthy or whether there's been damage. And I've always felt that that was kind of impressive, that you can look at a bunch of squiggles on a sheet of paper and figure out, oh, it looks like there has been damage to the lower left third of the heart. And it's like, whoa, okay. Um, I've never, that's, you know, things that you learn in medical school, or if you become an ECG technician, they'll train you how to interpret all of that. I've never taken that training, so uh, I've never um, been able to really kind of figure all of that out. But it's really fascinating to me. All right. Well, that's a lot about the heart. But let's talk about other parts of the cardiovascular system. And the other major organs, as we mentioned before, are the blood vessels. So I want to take a little time first and just talk about the, the anatomy and the structure of blood vessels, primarily looking at the differences between arteries and veins. And so we're just going to kind of work through this figure right here. And blood vessels, though, are structurally pretty much the same thing. They use essentially the same types of tissues in order to make these conduits or these tubes that blood is able to flow through and then begins to branch out into a wider and wider network, um, resulting in the formation of capillary beds. So what do we have? Well, we've got um, arteries here. And the main layers of a blood vessel is that there's an outer layer that is made out of connective tissue. This is sometimes referred to as a tunic or tunica. That simply means a coat or a layer. And the outer layer is sometimes referred to as the tunica externa, because it's on the outside, it's external. You've also, um, uh, a more fancy name is sometimes called the tunica adventitia. All right. But it's a connective tissue layer. It's mostly dense, irregular connective tissue because it's for strength. It's to help deal with the level of pressure that is being exerted from the inside as the blood is flowing through the vessels there's a lot of force pushing against it and particularly in the larger blood vessels there's a greater amount of force and so we need a reinforcing layer inside of that is a smooth muscle tissue layer and this can be more actively controlled by the autonomic nervous system to also provide um, counteracting tension against the internal blood pressure and can also be used to help regulate the diameter of these vessels. And that'll become really important in just a second when we start talking about blood pressure. All right. Finally, the innermost layer is the layer of the endothelium, which is um, a layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue that makes a nice smooth, even lining so that blood is able to flow through these vessels with reduced levels of friction. Well, if you look over here at the vein, you'll find that essentially it's the same layers of tissue because overall the vessels have the same job. Their job is to conduct the blood and they have some of the same um, uh, forces applying to them. So there's still some internal blood pressure, although as we're going to see, not nearly as much in a vein as there is in an artery. And so 
there will be differences. So we still have a connective tissue layer, a smooth muscle layer, and an endothelium layer. But again, a couple of things that make veins a little bit different. One you'll see is that overall the connective tissue and smooth muscle layers are not as thick. And that's because, as we're going to see, the veins aren't being subjected to the same level of internal pressure that the arteries are. And so they don't need to be as robust. They don't need to be as, as strong. All right? The other thing, then, if you take a look at, and you'll see that the endothelium is mostly the same, but within a lot of veins, particularly longer veins that are coming up from the limbs, there are little sets of valves. I want to take a little bit of a closer look at this. Um, as we're going to be talking about, due to the drop in blood pressure, there's not as much force trying to propel blood through the veins after they have passed through the capillaries. And so in order to aid the circulation of the blood back through the veins and getting it back to the heart, a lot of veins have these kind of semi-lunar type one-way valves so that as blood passes through them, they get a little bit of an assistance um, from surrounding um, layers of things like muscle tissue. So this would be like down in our legs, like around where our calves are. When we flex our legs and cause the muscles in them to contract, the muscles bulge and then they squeeze in and they push in on the sides of a, of a vein and that helps to force some blood forward and it forces it up through a valve, but then other blood might accidentally get pushed backwards, but that catches in the pockets of the valves and these are just like the semilunar valves of the heart and it closes the valves and it keeps the blood from being pushed back down the leg again. So this is really important in helping to maintain um, proper blood flow and returning all the blood back to the heart because this system isn't allowed to work properly. You don't get an equal return of heart. More blood actually can be pumped out of the systemic loop then returns back to the heart again and then you start getting an imbalance and you're not getting as much blood being returned to the right side of the heart and being sent through the pulmonary loop which means not as much blood gets reoxygenated and so overall blood oxygenation levels um, start to decline if we don't get proper circulation. This is why in a hospital setting when patients have been bedridden for long periods of time it's important to come in and get them to move their legs or provide massage therapy to squeeze the legs because otherwise blood has a tendency to pool in the extremities particularly in human legs and so they begin to kind of don't get as much oxygen delivery to the rest of the blood again. Kind of a more extreme example of this, although it can be something that happens um, in situations like weddings. I don't know, have you ever been to a wedding or seen um, videos of people's weddings online where just before the ceremony starts, you know, you've got the groom who's been standing, um, you know, at the head of the aisle waiting for the bride to make her um, dramatic and, and beautiful entrance uh, and everyone's just standing around waiting for it. You ever notice that grooms have a tendency to faint? Um, why does that happen? Well, the reason it often happens is that the guy standing at the head of the aisle is just trying to stand like totally still, be calm, be, you know, be look, you know, totally in control. But there's a tendency for people to stand still to lock their knees and that actually helps to inhibit blood flow returning to the heart. And so blood tends to pool down in the lower leg and you don't get enough delivery to back to the heart again. Oxygen levels begin to decline and because we're not getting as much oxygen being sent through the systemic loop, especially back up to the brain, the guy gets lightheaded and he falls over. All right. Now some people end up in positions where they have to stand still for long periods of time. You know, things like, you know, like soldiers on guard duty, you know, and particularly ceremonial guards. Like, I, I think I always think about the case of the guards at Buckingham Palace, you know, who the guys who stand out the outer gates where all the tourists come up. And apparently the big deal is to try to get these guys who have to be remain rock still, rigid, no expression on their face, try to get them to break expression or something like that. But they're able to stand there for hours at a time, completely unmoving. And it's like, well, how do they keep from fainting and falling over? Well, the secret is actually in their uniforms, okay? The ceremonial uniforms that these guards wear include pants with very, very wide legs in the trousers. 
And so it hangs very still and it looks like they're not moving their legs, but inside, here's the secret. They're doing little muscle contraction and relaxations and they're slightly letting their knees bend and come back again. So they're actually able to use their muscles to squeeze all of this blood through their legs and maintain proper blood flow. All right. So let's talk about the mechanics of blood flow and kind of how blood circulates through a circulatory system. And I absolutely love this figure um, out of your textbook. I think it, it really highlights some of the interrelationships that we see in circulation. So what we see here, for example, are three different graphs that then are being related to the overall um, arrangement of blood vessels in a circulatory system, specifically in the systemic loop of circulation, where we start with like the aorta branching into major arteries and arterioles. We then get into the capillary network where um, there's actual exchange of materials, and then the venules and veins, and then finally back to the vena cava, returning back to the heart. All right, so this kind of shows the vessels themselves, but then we're looking at three interrelated aspects. Mostly we're looking at things like the velocity, the speed of blood through the systemic loop. We're looking at something called the total cross-sectional area of all the blood vessels, and I'll explain how that's important in, in just a second. And then finally, we're looking at the factor of blood pressure. All right. And we're going to take some time and we're going to talk about all of these. All right, so first let's talk about what happens with the flow of blood through the circulatory system and the speed at which it passes through the system. Because this is actually important because the speed of blood has a direct relationship on how much oxygen per minute is being delivered to the cells and tissues. All right, And to understand though some of the aspects of blood flow to velocity is that we need blood to flow at a certain speed to deliver the right amount of oxygen per unit at a time, but we can't allow it to flow too quickly because if blood flows too quickly, there's not enough time for oxygen to diffuse out of red blood cells and then get to the tissues. And so blood needs to actually slow down in the capillaries. Let's go back for just a second here. All right, so you can take then a look at this velocity chart right here. All right, so again, when blood is leaving the aorta, it's actually moving at a pretty fast rate, just under 50 centimeters uh, per second. But then as the blood branches through the rest of the blood vessels, the speed of blood flow drops to a very, very low rate as it goes through the capillaries. And then it's able to speed up a little bit as it returns its way back to the heart. All right. it's, this, it's this drop in blood velocity is crucial to proper um, delivery of oxygen um, and the delivery of other materials and the whole business of capillary exchange. All right. So the question is, is, why does it slow down that way? Well, that's where th these points come in, okay, is that we are constrained a little bit by some basic laws of fluid physics. And there's something in, um, in the laws of, of fluid dynamics called the law of constancy which basically states that any time that you have fluid traveling through a vessel, through some kind of conduit, if the diameter of that vessel is reduced, then suddenly the fluid will start traveling at a much faster rate through it, assuming that we're, having, we're constantly putting the same amount of fluid into the vessel at one time. All right. Most of you have practical understanding of that. If you've ever worked with a garden hose outside your house, how can you make the water flow more rapidly and spread at a further distance? Well, you put your thumb over the end of the hose. And because you're reducing the diameter of the opening, all of the water that you're trying to pump through it now has to be forced through a more narrow opening. It speeds up and with that increased velocity gives it more force to be cast a greater distance. All right, so that's the law of constancy at work, okay? And of course, there is a converse to this that the reverse happens if you increase the diameter. So if you have a narrow pipe and then you allow the amount of fluid flowing in it to go into a wider pipe, a wider area, that's going to cause um, the um, flow to decrease. Okay, so the lower the diameter, the more narrow, 
Um, yes. So yeah, a, a, a narrow diameter. So we're talking about you know the size of the opening right there. So the diameter would be the distance across in that situation. Okay, and so you know if you narrow it down, then blood goes faster. If you widen it out, it goes slower. All right. And so this can at first be a little bit confusing. Yeah, there is a formula for that. I, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, quick Google search, you can probably find it. Okay, so here's the thing that's a little bit counterintuitive, though, is that if you look at the circulatory system, as you branch off of the aorta into arteries and then the arteries branch into arterioles, yes, every branch point causes there to be a more narrow diameter. So you would think blood would flow faster through all of those vessels. But because we're branching off, we're splitting the volume of blood into different vessels. And the total number of branches, if we combine their diameter, all right, and measure that out. And again, you can measure the area of a circle, you know, or is that pi r squared, I think is the area of a circle. So you could measure at any point in the vessel based on its diameter, and half of a diameter is the radius, so there's your r. You could calculate what is the um, area of a cross-section of a piece of diameter, and if you begin to add all of that up, it gets a little bit bigger. Now, you're probably going, I don't get this. I have a picture. All right, so think about it this way. So here we have a large artery that maybe has a diameter of one centimeter. This is pretty close to the aorta or some of the first large vessels that branch off of it. So let's say it has a diameter of one centimeter, all right? And that the blood that is flowing through this vessel is flowing at a speed of 40 centimeters per second, all right? But then we branch this vessel into two pieces and each branch has a slightly more narrow diameter of only 0.75 centimeters. All right? So it's a more narrow diameter here and a more narrow diameter here. But if we combine the total diameter of both vessels, 0.75 plus 0.75 is 1.75, the combined diameter is much wider. And because it's wider, the flow of blood through these vessels has been now been reduced to something maybe like 30 centimeters per second. All right. So that's where, again, going back to, I'm sorry, let me go back, back to this diagram. That's the relationship. Really what you're looking at in this figure is comparing the top graph in the middle graph right here. So as the velocity decreases, it's because the total area of all of the combined capillaries is massive. And so you're spreading out all that blood over through a much wider space, and this is what allows it to slow down. And you can see down here, I make a note here, in humans, it's been measured and the speed of the blood through those capillaries is reduced down, you know, to 0 0.026 centimeters per second. The blood kind of comes almost to a crawl through the capillaries, whereas when it left the heart in the aorta, it was doing about 50 centimeters a second. So this is a very significant slowdown, but this is what's needed to allow time for oxygen to diffuse out of the blood and carbon dioxide to come in and to unload nutrients and other, other materials that the cells need to survive and pick up all of their waste products. All right, question, how do I get 30 again? I'll be honest, it was kind of a quick estimation that there's something of an inverse relationship between the diameter of, of the vessel, the combined diameter of the vessel, and the rate of flow through it. So I've, I kind of just, um, without looking at the formula in my head, I figured, okay, since I'm increasing the diameter, the combined diameter of these two vessels um, by a factor of about 50%, I figured I would reduce the speed by about um, um, by one quarter. 
Um, I, again, just kind of to give you an idea of how it gets reduced down, you would actually have to look up the, um, the law of constancy in order um, to figure out exactly what the reduced flow rate would be. So there is a way of calculating it. I'm not going to ask you to calculate it. I just want you to understand the concept behind it. Okay. So what do we got left? All right. So we got just a few more minutes left. Let's talk about blood pressure. All right. So blood pressure is really important because this is what we call this is can, this is the force that actually causes blood to flow. I mean, technically, this is the whole role of the heart. The real role of the heart is to create pressure. All right. And why do we need this pressure? Because it's that pressure that then forces the liquids and all the materials in the blood to actually be put through. All right. So um, the whole purpose then of the heart is to produce a very high level of pressure. And this high level of pressure, okay, is what forces it. Now, the thing is, is that when the ventricles contract, they really add to it because now they're trying to force a, a volume of blood out of the ventricles into blood vessels that are already filled with blood. And so you're basically trying to force more fluid into a confined space. And as a result of that, um, the pressure peaks in the aorta. And so you get a very high level of pressure. We call this the systolic pressure because it is related to systole. It's related to the contraction of the heart. All right. Now, even when the heart relaxes, though, and we're no longer maintaining systole, we're going into diastole, the vessels themselves with that um, connective tissue, which has a little bit of elasticity, as well as the smooth muscle tissue, which can actively contract, that still maintains a level of pressure. It drops a little bit while the heart is relaxing, but we still maintain a positive level of pressure. And so we have what we call the diastolic pressure. All right, and the, as the diastolic pressure then kind of declines, um, we can build back up to systolic. And so this is kind of the pulse. The pulse is all about going between high pressure and low pressure. And so when they measure blood pressure, that's where those two numbers come from, like that, that 120 over 80. 120 represents the systolic pressure, and the 80 is the diastolic pressure. And it kind of alternates between those two. All right. Now the thing about blood pressure, though, is that as it travels through the system, Pressure continually declines, mm -hmm. and it cannot be rebuilt until blood gets back to the heart. All right, and so here you can see in the blood pressure graph as we go through the system, we get through the capillaries, the venules, and the veins. It's always dropping, always declining until we get to the vena cava. And when the ve when the blood hits the vena cava as it enters into the right atrium of the heart, the pressure is almost at zero. All right, so there's just no pressure. But that's what causes blood to flow from the aorta all the way back through the vena cava, is that there's always a pressure gradient. Right? And blood will only flow from areas of high pressure to areas of lesser pressure. Right? But once you get down to a lower level of pressure, blood flow can become severely inhibited. So this is why low blood pressure can be a real problem, because this curve essentially maintains its shape no matter what the starting pressure is, no matter what the starting systolic and diastolic pressures are. So if there's something happens that causes blood pressure to drop down and maybe the systolic becomes 80 and the diastolic becomes 40, it's like taking the whole curve and pushing it straight down. And what that would do is that would cause blood pressure to hit zero in the bigger veins. And once you're at zero, it's kind of hard to get blood to flow from zero to zero. And the whole velocity of blood also drops, and so you get very inhibited blood flow. So this is why it's important that the heart function properly, because if the heart doesn't function right, you're not maintaining blood pressure, or blood pressure crashes, circulation can come to a halt, and now we're not delivering oxygen to vital organs and tissues, and bad things tend to happen, right?
I'm just going to take a couple of minutes here, <clears throat> and we'll have to pick up on this one in our next session here. Um, but what are the major things that then affect blood pressure? Well, ultimately, blood pressure is a function of how much blood are in the vessels at any given time. All right? And so the basic equation is pretty simple. The more blood is in the vessels, the higher the pressure there is going to be generated. The less blood there is, the less pressure. So this is why if someone had suffers a severe injury and starts bleeding, okay, the leakage of blood out of the circulatory system means that there's less volume of blood. It's hard to maintain blood pressure if there's no blood in the body in the first place. So that's why it's important for severe bleeding injuries that are to stop or stem the blood flow because otherwise we're not going to have enough pressure going and we're not going to maintain it. All right. So that's kind of the main thing there. Um, so how does that work? Well, blood volume in the vessels in a healthy, non-bleeding person is simply one of basing cardiac output. If you remember cardiac output, we studied in the previous lesson, cardiac output is a function of how many beats per minute, how fast the heart is beating, times the stroke volume, or how much blood the ventricles eject at one time. Okay. So there's sort of that factor. So how much are you putting into the vessels at the start of the circuit? But then there's also something called peripheral resistance, which, you know, is kind of the fact that the blood doesn't want to flow very easily through the vessels. And it's particularly, it doesn't want to flow through more narrow openings of the branch points. And so there's a resistance to flowing forward. And this is affected, again, by the diameter of things like arterioles and special little muscles that lead into capillary beds called sphincter muscles that can constrict and help to regulate how much blood goes into a set of capillaries at the first, in the first place. All right. So I think when we pick up on the next one, I'm going to walk you through these factors real quick. So we'll just have a, a few minutes of um, finishing up um, cardiovascular systems. And then I think we're going to look forward to and try to get into respiratory systems. So that's kind of where we are for now. So thank you so much for joining and we'll see you in the next class. You guys have a great day.